So here with Caroline McKenna and uh, Dermot Whelan, both very well known people in their own right. And both are setting off to Kilimanjaro. So that's a conversation, all things about Kilimanjaro and, and why. So I'm going to turn to you, Caroline, first, just maybe just to give you a little bit background um, about yourself and uh, this endeavor, and then we'll turn to Dermot. So thank you, Patrick. It's good to see you again. And it's an honor to be on here. I am very excited for this journey to Kilimanjaro. And thanks to you, you've been helping me prepare for this huge task that I'm about to take on in just over three and a half weeks. I am heading to Kilimanjaro and to give you a bit of a background, I have just recently moved home to Ireland after living in Australia for seven years. And this year has been a year of taking on new things, trying something different. I've been in a very safe zone for the past seven years out in Australia in a comfortable teaching job and I decided that I wanted to explore more about well-being, mental health, looking after the body and breath work. And that's what I've been doing recently. And I came up to your amazing facilities there in Galway in, I think it was March or April, and started to do a bit of work. And the week after that, I headed to Poland and spent a week with Wim Hof, who told me that he climbed Kilimanjaro in two days in shorts. And um, he said no one no one said he could do it and he did it. And he said when he got down, all those who said he couldn't do it, nor, they were nowhere to be seen. So he's all about, you know, breaking boundaries and being powerful with your mind. So I thought, you know, if I can last a week in the minus freezing cold conditions with Wim Hof in Poland, then maybe Kilimanjaro will be a breeze. And as the months have gone on, the, the fear has started to creep in again. And um, that's where you've stepped in to help me with my breath work. And I've realized that, you know, a lot of it is the mindset and the lungs and looking after your breath and your breath holes in order to get up that mountain. And it's not really about how many mountains you climb between now and then. So I'm heading off on the 10th of September for, it's going to take me seven days to climb it. I'm not as adventurous as Wim Hof because I am aware the altitude is the biggest issue here. It's not the fitness levels. It's about getting to the top without getting very sick. And um, I'm planning on spreading that out over seven days with still a very high risk of altitude sickness. Um, and I'm doing it for Pip's suicide prevention charity, trying to raise £10,000. What a great cause. Thank you. Well done. And are you a little, you're a little bit nervous at this moment, but I think you take challenges in your stride. You're pretty resilient as well. This will add to it anyway. This is another one you ticked <laughs> off the bucket list. The thing about when you put something out on social media, it's it's out there. So You're committed I, to it, Dan. You can't pull out of it now, Caroline. I came off uh, Wim Hof's retreat on a bit of a buzz thinking I can achieve anything. And I put it out there to the universe and said, I'm doing Kilimanjaro. But um, no, look, there's been a few doubts that have crossed my mind. And it's actually been really helpful working with you and um, reading the Oxygen Advantage book. And just, you know, even I was reading about um, how Bear Grylls trained mm. for base camp at Everest and it was lengths in the pool. So it reassures me because I don't have the time to climb mountains three or four times a week and, you know, life is busy. So it's trying to make sure to get in the right mindset and also sleep, getting a good night's sleep is key to all of this. So it's been a, a challenging time, but also a great time of learning. Um, I've learned a lot about the capacity that the body can can go to you know what levels you can take your body to and it really does come down to the mind the breath and sleep good stuff so Dermot your story and of course you broke massive news yesterday it was coming to me from all directions so those of you who are international Dermot is a very well known radio presenter here in Ireland and uh, he's left this huge job um, to embark on a career of mindfulness. But of course, you've dipped your toe into it in quite a bit anyway. It's not your first, your 40. It, you know, you've you've been involved in that field. So a little bit about your story. You're heading off also to Kilimanjaro. Yeah, and I guess for me, Kilimanjaro, first of all, thank you for having us on, Patrick. It's a, a real pleasure to be back with you again and to, to meet Caroline in person. We've uh, I actually interviewed Caroline. She's got a fascinating story herself, and I hope people get a chance to catch up with that. 
Um, but I interviewed uh, Caroline on, on the radio not so long ago, so it's lovely to to see your face in person. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, Cal- Kilimanjaro represents uh, you know, this change of direction that I, I feel that my life is taking, and it, it's actually I was thinking about it today. It's a it's a wonderful, I guess, physical you know, real world representation of of a, a new journey for me that I'm embarking on. And as you say correctly, I, it, it's not my first foray into this, but over the last five years, I've been teaching in the meditation space. Um, certainly wasn't something I was always into. You know, I was very much a, a cynic back in the day, but um, a panic attack in, in 2007 sort of woke me up to the world of um the kinds of thoughts that we have in our head and uh, ideas of around anxiety and how to cope with that and stress management and how much we say yes to and how much we say no to. So my journey began back then, you know, um, and over the years, I'm delighted to say that I've managed to blend my background of stand up comedy and meditation into a vehicle for people to to jump on board who may be a little bit cynical or, or maybe hesitant to, to step into the whole wellness or spiritual um, realm, you know. So uh, I take great pride in in being able to use my comedic skills to, to convey real scientifically proven techniques that you're well aware of yourself and, and maybe bring people into this world that uh, normally may have felt a little bit excluded. So for me, Kilimanjaro, as I say, is... Um, now that I'm taking the step away from uh, what is a perfectly good, well-paid job <laughs> and stepping out into, uh, you know, very a very unknown world for me, Kilimanjaro is 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 a big challenge. And just like the, the challenge I'm taking in my in my working life, um, uh, you know, this this is something that's, I guess, one of those things that I have said in the back of my mind. I would always love to do. The opportunity arose with. Uh, a great Irish company called Earth's Edge, who approached me to see if I would like to take uh, twenty meditators up there with me and um, and see how we get on and and really use this as a an intention setting adventure for for everybody involved and and that's what I'm really excited to to do. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, I suppose the purpose of us getting together today was to talk about insights of what we can do and what what to expect going up. I haven't climbed, of course, so I'm approaching it from a theoretical point of view. You're going to be the guys putting it into practice. This is if if the book, this is where the the theory is fitting the practice. So we hope that there's a good fit there. Um, Yeah, I think there's a number of things. So probably will I do a little bit of explanation or background into if if one was climbing, what way is the best way and what are the things to take into consideration? Absolutely. I'll explain a little bit of the science because I think it's important to have the background. So at sea level, where we are at now, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So we remember those columns of mercury in the old clocks years ago. Uh, the amount of pressure that it takes to drive the the mercury up the column. So 760 millimetres of mercury is the pressure here of the atmosphere at sea level. And of that oxygen is 21%. 21% of 760 is 160. So the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 160. When we take a breath of air into our lungs, it mixes with stale air and water vapour. So the pressure of oxygen in the lungs is 100. And that, in turn, is determining the pressure of oxygen in the blood leaving the lungs by diffusion. You go up the mountain, the concentration of oxygen is still 21%, but the atmosphere is thinner. So the atmospheric pressure is less. So it's 21% of a lesser figure. So hence the blood oxygen saturation can drop. And the other factor to take into consideration is that we breathe and how we breathe is influenced by atmospheric pressure. That when we go up a mountain, the atmospheric pressure is less. So the breathing muscles have to work harder. So they're more prone to fatigue. So not only are we taking in less oxygen, but the breathing muscles also need to work harder. So there's two aspects to it. And then there's another aspect would be the feeling and sensation of breathlessness. So I think at sea level, it can be very useful to expose ourselves to breath holding, to create an experience of hypoxia to prepare the body. And this is what Caroline was talking about, Barry Grills. And of course, doing long breath holes in a swimming pool is, is not a good thing to do. Um, 
but you can do it on land and you can do it safely and you can also do it within your limits. And if you're doing long breath holds, I'd say to anybody, don't do it if you have panic disorder. I have put people into panic attacks doing long breath holds. So we try and steer a little bit away from that. So the other aspect of it is strengthening the diaphragm and strengthening the diaphragm so the diaphragm is better able to cope with the additional demands that it's going to take at altitude. And also doing long breath holds can induce a sensation of breathlessness. There's another thing to do is, is to breathe in a way that improves alveolar ventilation. So I know I'm kind of a little bit all over the place, but I'm going to put them point by point now. I'm going to start off with functional breathing first. Is there a way to breathe to enhance gas exchange? Without going into the mats too much, every breath that we take, not all of the air that we bring into our nose or mouth reaches the small air sacs in the lungs. The last 150 ml of air stays in what's called dead space. And if we're breathing fast and shallow, we waste a lot more air in dead space per minute. So at altitude, you're going to feel breathless because the air is thinner. And that in turn will cause us to breathe fast and shallow. And fast and shallow breathing is inefficient because of the air lost to dead space. There is a paper that was done on this, and it's quite interesting looking at slow breathing. And the individuals were climbing, I think at four and a half thousand meters and also at 5,000 meters. I just have to put up the paper. But basically they got the individuals to slow down their breathing to six breaths per minute. And by slowing down breathing to six breaths per minute, it was able to improve alveolar ventilation, but also blood oxygen saturation quite significantly. I think this is a pivotal paper. This is just based on normal physiology. So let's pull that up and I will do a share screen on it. And then I'll go through the other stuff as well. So here we have the paper itself. And I'm just going to minimize everything. I'm going to scroll down. So we have four and a half thousand meters here for three days and just 39 people involved. 5,400 meters for 16 days. And there's 28 people involved. So in study A, the uh, blood oxygen saturation was 80%, which is severe hypoxia. And by slowing down breathing to six breaths per minute, but without increasing minute ventilation, which I'll explain in a little bit. So simply by slowing down the respiratory rate and allowing the tidal volume, which is the volume of air drawn into the, into the lungs per minute, to increase proportionately. So we're not breathing any more air per minute. We're just changing the respiratory rate. So with this, it increased blood oxygen saturation from 80% to 89%. And in study B, breathing at six breaths per minute, increased blood oxygen saturation from 81 to 88.6%. So I think the most important thing to take from this is, whenever you feel breathless at altitude, not to breathe fast and shallow, even though that's going to be the way that you want to feel that you breathe. Because human nature, if somebody is having a panic attack or an anxiety attack or a hyperventilation or an asthma attack, that feeling of air hunger, we naturally revert to fast and shallow breathing in an effort to alleviate the feeling of air hunger. However, the fast and shallow breathing, a lot of the air stays in dead space. It's coming into the body all right, but it's not reaching the small air sacs in the lungs. So this is where no slow and low breathing works. So you know what? We might as well give it a go, yeah? So if you have your hand and your lower ribs. So this is just to give you a kind of a, an insight into it. And basically we're going to be breathing in for a count of six and breathing out for a count of six. So you're breathing in two, three, four, five, six, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. So I started off, I was counting for six seconds in, seconds out, six seconds out. It should be five seconds. So that was my mistake there. So just bear in mind, no slow, low. So I think the take here is at altitude, one is going to feel breathless. Even if you're not able to slow down the respiratory rate to six breaths per minute, 
whatever you can slow down the respiratory rate by is going to improve alveolar ventilation. Does that make sense? And this is where pulse oximeter um, is quite useful. So these are little devices that you place in your pointing finger and it's able to pick up in your hemoglobin and whether it's, it's occupied by oxygen. So the main carrier of oxygen in the blood is hemoglobin. 98.5% of our oxygen is carried bound by hemoglobin. And when you, in normal circumstances, you put on a pulse oximeter, your normal blood oxygen saturation is between 95 to 99%. But in that paper that we looked at earlier on, the blood oxygen saturation had dropped down to 80%, which is severe hypoxia. So there is a way to breathe to improve alveolar ventilation at altitude. Now, of course, people are going to say, there's no way I can slow down breathing at altitude. I'll have to have my mouth open. Okay, even if you have your mouth open, still be conscious of, you're much better off to take fuller breaths and less of them. So does that make sense? In terms of when we look at breathing, we're looking at the respiratory rate multiplied by the tidal volume to give us minute ventilation. Slow down or reduce the respiratory rate, but take fuller breaths without hyperventilating. Now, the likelihood is that one is going to hyperventilate anyway at altitude because in order to make up for the reduction of blood oxygen saturation, breathing is going to get harder and faster. The risk with hyperventilation is that we get rid of too much carbon dioxide. This drives blood pH too high. This can cause arousal of the, the mind, arousal of the central nervous system, the brain. So on that basis as well, it's just been cognizant of the volume of air. Breathing what you need, um, but breathing it in a way to improve alveolar ventilation. So that's, I suppose, the first point that I would say. And I don't want to be talking Patrick, for the entire time. So. Well, there it is. Yeah, could I? It, it, and to obviously, it you know helps you your to stay a bit more stable and relaxed, you know, in that altitude, high altitude setting. But does this directly combat the symptoms of altitude sickness? And, yes. And does it? Does it prevent and also help you to to deal with though to manage any symptoms that you may have? Yeah, a lot of the symptoms are going to be due to the hypoxic effect from climbing altitude. So it's due to the drop in oxygen. Now, here's the thing though: if you're at walking at you know at a pace, it's I'm not going to say it's easy to control your breathing, but what I would have is whatever you can do to slow down the respiratory rate and take fuller breaths. I think it's really important to bring a pulse oximeter so that you're able to gauge it. And do you have breaks? I don't know what's the procedure. Like if you're walking, do you have to walk with everybody or do you have breaks or can you take your own breaks or what way does it work? Does anybody know? I don't know about you, Dermot, but I know for us it's it's in a grip setting and we will walk for a maximum of seven hours a day. Um, I think we'll stop for like a morning tea break and then an afternoon tea break but we usually get to camp around six or seven in the evening and then there's a lot of downtime but they make you climb so far up and then back down a little bit to acclimatize so you'll go up so far and then start to come down again but you will be walking as a group so I think the thing is that everybody must go at the same pace so if someone starts to set the pace quite fast then it could impact the whole group so it's really important that all the things that you're telling me now, I'm literally regurgitating to my group so that we're all on the same path because we need to get up there together. Totally, totally. Um, and you, even wearing pulse oximeters, you know, a great little tool, even just for peace of mind that you see. Um, because sometimes the symptoms of altitude sickness could be due to there's a crossover, headaches, feeling nausea, whatever symptoms there are. One might have a head cold and they're associating it. They're thinking then it's it's due to altitude sickness or whatever. Um, so the other aspect then the downtime of the evening could be a very good opportunity then to be slowing down breathing as well but also for state of mind if one was feeling a little bit anxious due to the sensation of breathlessness because I think that's kind of an individual effect isn't it you know if somebody is feeling breathless one person may be fine with it but another person may not be yeah so, I, yeah sorry Dermot yeah, I, I think, I, I guess, looking at it from, from the meditation slant as well, it would be very attractive for me um, to be able to to get into a group and and introduce those, those breathing techniques where you are slowing down your breath to say six breaths per minute and and in doing so, help people to, to calm down and find a little 
a bit of peace and calm if 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 they have been finding the whole situation a little bit stressful. So you're kind of, as you say, you're killing two birds at one stone there. And especially down regulating before sleep as well. So mm-hmm. bolt score is something we use on land um, at, at sea level, and we use it to describe if a person is functional breathing or not. And that's when you breathe in, breathe out and hold your breath and you're timing it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. Your breath hold time at altitude gives you feedback of the degree of acclimatization. If, for example, you're not coping so well and you're overly breathless, when you sit down for a few minutes and you take your breath hold time, it's going to be really, really low. So before we were preparing, one guy was Michael Klein a few years ago. And I think also he did Kilimanjaro. He's an, he's an American, C-O-Y-N-E. And he also was using these tools as well and using breath toll time. So breath toll time might give you some degree. Now, of course, you're going to feel it. You're going to know anyway. But it might give you some degree of feedback as to whether if you have a reasonably good breath toll time at altitude. But then the question to ask is, can we be working on breath hold time at land before we get there? So then what exercises to do in terms of creating a hypoxic effect to prepare your body that it's not going to be the first time that you're lowering your blood oxygen saturation below 95% or 91%. And that's what breath hold training. So, you know, I'll give a description of it. What program would I use? Um, the one that we've always used, dip your toe into the water. <clears throat> None of us know really how we're going to respond to the sensation of air hunger. In general, people respond quite well, but people with trauma or panic disorder or anxiety, they may have a stronger reaction to it. So I think as a preparation in a group, start off with taking normal breath in and out through the nose, pinch the nose, hold your nose and walk 10 or 15 paces holding your breath. Do that a couple of times. Let go, breathe in through your nose. Wait about a minute and then increase it to maybe 20, 25 paces. Wait about a minute and then increase it to 30, 35 paces. Wait about a minute with normal breathing and then increase it to maybe 40, 40, 45 paces. So you're incrementally increasing it to find how far can you push it, but still have good control of your breathing at the end. Your breathing should recover in about two breaths or so. So the premise there would be, when you do a long breath hold, on a theoretical level, your blood oxygen saturation is dropping. There's less oxygen getting to the kidneys and to the liver to, the lesser, to a lesser extent. And this, in turn, is synthesizing a hormone called erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is a hormone that causes the maturation of red blood cells. So at altitude, part of the, climate, or part of the reason that alt- athletes do it is they go up into altitude in order to call, force the body to make adaptations. And those adaptations include increased red blood cell um, for oxygen carrying capacity. Breath holding on land could help to do that. But I think another thing with breath holding is you're deliberately creating a sensation of breathlessness to get your body used to it because it's quite uncomfortable. You know, I think we had this conversation, I know with Caroline and also with Dermot, very often in today's world, we, we live in comfort societies. We don't like discomfort. So off Caroline goes, does the Wim Hof, she's doing ice, ice water. She's doing hyperventilation on breath holes. It's a deliberate discomfort that we have no option but to surrender to it. At altitude, the sensation of air hunger is uncomfortable. So it's almost by doing the breath holes on at sea level in preparation to prepare yourself to be able to psychologically tolerate the degree of breathlessness. So it, it, it's almost, it's reducing your perception of breathlessness because you're already used to it because you've surrendered to it at sea level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I, and I, for, um, I was just going to say, you know, holding your breath, it, it, it can be quite overwhelming. And a lot of people I notice, even when I'm doing the oxygen advantage training, um, and doing it with um, my workshops, people all of a sudden think, oh, God, you know, I don't know if I can do this. But I, what I would recommend is the baby steps. And the first step that I ever took was myotape going from the beginning, just starting to actually try and train myself to nasal breathe. And then that in turn has led me to be able to nasal breathe on the treadmill. Now, two and a half weeks ago, Patrick, I was nasal breathing for four minutes on the treadmill and that was it. And two and a half weeks later, 
I'm at 30 minutes on the treadmill. I mean, this stuff works. It really does. And for someone that might think, you know, what's a few breath holes going to do? This isn't really going to change anything. I cannot believe the difference. And even just the focus, the energy, all that comes from these techniques that you're teaching us. So it is so important for people that are listening to, to really give it even just a week to see the difference that this makes. Yeah. I, you know what the other thing is? I think it's like everything that, that we're all talking about German as well. If it works, we're going to know about it because our body is going to tell us, you know, and, and normally we feel it pretty quickly. If we can do it in a week, great. Sometimes with some people, it might take two weeks, but even two weeks is a short, short time in the spectrum of things. Now, and the final point that I would consider is how do you have to strengthen the diaphragm breathing muscle? So if you've got a stronger diaphragm, you're less likely to experience breathlessness because it's not going to tire as much. And you don't want your diaphragm getting tired because if the diaphragm getting gets tired, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. And that's why there's a movement in terms of athletic using different devices, such as power breathe and different devices that you're breathing against resistance to add an extra load to the diaphragm breathing muscle to strengthen it. So it's less likely then to, to you're, not, you're not as likely then to feel breathlessness. A few ways. You spoke about nose breathing during jogging, nose breathing during walking. That's adding a resistance to your breathing. You're adding an extra load to the diaphragm. Something like wearing a sports mask or any other, you know, respiratory muscle training device is also going to add an extra load to the diaphragm. So I'm going to come full circle. We said there were... Anybody climbing or preparing for climbing altitude, there is a few considerations to take. One is how should you breathe during the ascent? Even though you're feeling air hunger and your breathing is faster and your breathing is harder, you want to help to improve your breathing efficiency by focusing on taking less breaths per minute, but make the breaths fuller, but don't hyperventilate. So in other words, don't deliberately make the breath so full that you're breathing more air than what you would normally be breathing at that time. So that's one, because that improves alveolar ventilation. It's entirely based on physiology. You've seen a paper to back it up. The second is your breath hold time at land. Breath hold time at land gives you feedback of your functional breathing patterns. And if you have a low breath hold time at land, it's likely it's going to reflect in a poor or disproportionate breathlessness at altitude. So work with your breathing on land so that you're you're better able to cope then with the stress of less of less oxygen at altitude. The third one was using breath holding to create hypoxic effects. Number one is you're exposing your body to hypoxia, even though it's intermittent. In other words, it's only for a short period of time. It's controlled, but you're also experiencing breathlessness that same breathlessness you feel at altitude, so it will help to reduce the perception of breathlessness. And number four then is improving respiratory muscle strength, nose breathing during physical exercise, using different devices, sports masks, just power breathe, there's other devices out there. So all in all, I think it would be good preparation. You know, I think it's something to take into consideration. Yeah. Mm. I was actually thinking of you in the gym last night, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Because once you get into the whole nasal breathing frame of mind, it's always like Patrick is sitting over your shoulder going, I can see you mouth breathing. <laughs> so I was in the gym and I was doing some bench presses. And the, I guess the kind of natural urge when you're doing that is sort of big breaths and big, big power exhales and all that. And I found that the weight was getting quite heavy and I wasn't sure if I was going to reach the end of my set without having to called my son over to, to give me a dig out. And I said, actually, no, just let, let's see if if Patrick's techniques work or, or what happens if I actually do the opposite to what I, I feel I want to do in this situation with the heavy weight over me. So I started nasal breathing and slowing down my breath and ignoring the fact that I was lifting the, the weight up and down. And literally, it felt like I had taken five kilos off each end of the bar. The set was absolutely no problem to me. And I'm maybe there's some psychological things going on there in that because I'm not feeling like I'm, you know, really pushing it, that if my once I calm the breathing, slow the reduce the number of breaths per minute, that actually the process isn't stressful at all and, and the weight seemed lighter. 
uh, you know, that's not necessarily Kilimanjaro related, but it was just an interesting little experiment for me yesterday evening that in situations where we really feel the urge to to breathe heavily and, and more rapidly, when we can go against that and flip it, actually the, the exercise itself seems a lot easier and, and way less stressful. Yeah, I would agree with you, Dermot. You know, I w- I'm curious if you went into that same gym how many people are there doing all of their physical exercise pretty much with their mouth open? You know, sometimes the simplest things. And I don't know if we were talking about it in terms of mindfulness that we there's the simplest things that people are finally starting to see the benefits. Many have resisted and have been so cynical to it for a number of years. And breathing now is a hot topic. And you know, when we think about the benefits, both are interrelated. So in terms of mindfulness, you're taking your attention. Well, you can, you know what, I would love to get for you to give your take in terms of mindfulness and bringing breathing. And then for Caroline, in terms of your work, because I know you're focused very much on, on the schools, Caroline. So because there's a great fit, the two are very, very compatible. And even in the gym, if you're lifting weights and you're worried about what somebody is after saying to you, you're going to be totally distracted. You're not focused on what you're doing. You're not going to do it. You know, we all need to be able to place our attention. So what's, what's your take in a very simple, because sometimes I think people, mindfulness is not a great word. I don't know if it's a word that I would, I think there's better ways to explain it. Yeah, well, certainly it's one of those words um, that, I, yes, well, I would have a little bit of beef with in that, I think there's an there's an expectation on people to know and understand exactly what it is. Oh, mindfulness. But actually, people have a vague sense it has something to do with not being stressed out. Um, or maybe it's meditation or, or is it something to do with breathing? You know, and there's whole mindfulness sections in the bookshop. And sometimes I think it can be a little bit intimidating. There's again, there's that expectation to to know exactly what it is. And, you know, one of my favorite techniques of introducing people to the whole world of mindfulness is a chocolate meditation where you're getting people just to put chocolate you know to examine the chocolate to smell the chocolate to put it on their tongue and then they can move it around and then eventually they swallow it so it's just about introducing people to the idea of present moment awareness of being aware of where you are and what you're doing in that particular moment which seems so simple and obvious you're like well so what but actually when we look at our own lives, we see how distracted we are in every single moment. So if you are in the gym and you're doing bench presses, but you're thinking about a, a difficult meeting and work that happened a couple of hours before, you know, you're not going to be there. You're not going to be working with your body. You're not going to be getting the best workout and you probably won't feel particularly relaxed after it because you've been in, in a stress state for most of it. And then adding, you know, physical strain on top of that. So, um, you know, th- that's why I, what I love is is the blend of of you know the information in with your work and the oxygen advantage is that it has all these wonderful practical benefits you know of training at high altitude and um, settling your nervous system and but uh, but also what you're doing is you're using very ancient techniques you know that that calm your mind that can take you out of a worry state that can. I think the greatest benefit is that it's taking you out of the past and out of the future. You know, when we're in the past, we're maybe looking back with shame or guilt or regret. When we're in the future, we're anxious about things that may or may not happen. So there's just so many multiple benefits to it that it has the physical benefits. And, and you know, when you explain all the wonderful things that are happening in the lungs and the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, that stuff is really fascinating. But at the same time, just by doing that, we're calming our nervous systems. We're moving ourselves out of worry state. We're giving ourselves the ability to have more control over our nervous system, just like, um, you know, Wim Hof would, would attest to with the work that he does. Um, we're helping ourselves fall back to sleep. We're, you know, we're introducing, we're calming our digestive system, moving into that rest and digest state so we can actually start to get nutrients out of our food. So there's just so much going on. And again, it just boils back to the simplicity of connecting with our breath, of slowing down that breath. And um, it's sometimes I think the simplest things are the things that we're least likely to gravitate towards because we feel like it's too easy, you know? Yeah. Um, 
but as you say, you know, you were slightly ahead of the curve all of, you know, with all of this, like 20 years ago <laughs> and then the rest of us. But, the you know, the world is catching up and actually going, do you know what? There's immense power in a breath, you know, and there's there's even that sense of, of you know, when people are really struggling with uh, maybe it's things that have happened and, and they can't seem to to forgive themselves for something there's that phrase of you know with each breath i begin again and and we're giving ourselves permission in in each breath in each moment to actually start afresh and that's a that's a powerful feeling and and particularly if we're prone to beating ourselves up about things again it's the breath that gives us permission to to move ahead with that different state of mind so mm -hmm. i just think there's so much going on there's so much benefit there's so much power to just becoming aware of how we are breathing and mm -hmm. literally it starts mm -hmm. with one breath with each totally. breath we begin again totally agree and even that phrase you said particularly when people are beating themselves up and i'm going to put that to caroline because caroline i think a lot of kids are beating themselves up because of the pressures of social media the pressures of schools the pressures of all of the pressures that they are facing and going to young kids into their 20s to the point you're this is an interest that you have um, from a personal point of view. So what's your take? I've been teaching for the last 10 years, Patrick, and I consider myself, you know, not that old. And it's very scary. Well, in comparison to us, you're very young, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel old. Um, I'm 31 now. And um, it's very scary to see how quickly things are changing in the classroom on a daily basis. I mean, forget this chat uh, bot or whatever this, I don't know what it's called, this new chat, chat AI. GPT. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, there's we'll be all running from AI in about six months. We won't even be talking about mindfulness. <laughs> we'll be hiding somewhere. So well. We're we hiding on an island. There's that much happening on a day-to-day -day basis. But the one thing I am noticing more and more is the anxiety within the classroom. And these kids with the world at their feet have everything going for them are riddled with anxiety because of the access of social media and technology and not being able to remain focused and present in the current moment. And it's interesting, you know, what you said there, Dermot, just even about this is all accessible to everybody. And every time I put on a workshop and do the oxygen advantage work with anyone that comes to my retreats, you know, they come away from it and they think, God, that's great. And, you know, 95% of them might think that was great. And then they, they get in the car and they get back to their normal life. But that 5% will take it on and and learn from it and, and want to grow. But if it was a 20 pound membership a month to, to breathe, they might take more accountability to it. But when it's there and, you know, I'm, I'm the same at times where I know I need to go and do my breath work and I mightn't do it. But at nighttime, I have my myo tape sitting there at night and I know, right, I need to put that on before I go to bed. But in terms of the the generation that's coming um, through, this is something that I am very passionate about and that I think needs to be embedded in the curriculum. If I was taught just how to breathe properly before an exam, at times of worry and distress, in times of peer pressure, in times of depression, you know, feeling lost in society, feeling like you don't fit in in school. If I was just taught to just take a moment out of the madness and the chaos that is nothing like the world we live in today. You know, it's, this is 10 times worse now Then maybe things would have been different and I wouldn't have suffered for as many years as I've had, you know, at 31 years of age, I'm only starting to get a good night's sleep. I'm only learning to cope in stressful situations. I'm only learning to take a minute out before I react to things and even just standing in front of schools and, and doing seminars and talks to these kids, just learning to breathe before I get on that stage so that I don't stumble in their, those first few moments. They would have really benefited me at university, giving presentations or standing in front of the class, trying to read at the Christmas play, those kinds of things. This is so vital and so important, but it's like it's holding accountability. If there's no membership fee or anything like that, people are more inclined to think, oh, I'll do that eventually. And next thing, a few months have passed. But I'm so glad that your work is finally being recognized, Patrick, and being seen. And I think that the pandemic, for all that it's done for the world and it's been a tragic time, 
it has really opened many of our eyes and maybe Dermot this is why we have taken a change in our life I know for me it made me pull the plug on my lavish amazing beautiful life in Sydney looking out over the opera house and um, where my classroom was and and actually come back to what's making me happy you know is this fast-paced rat race lifestyle in the city what I want or do I just want to be at peace and that's when I've come back to this breath work so I think there's a lot to be done here I think people are really tuning in but there's the education around it you know there's that word mindfulness I don't like it I, I think it's outdated I think it puts a lot of kids off as soon as I would say you know we're going to do a meditation here they go oh but, you know, if I say, right, let's reset, let's change the word from mindfulness to just reset and everyone's having a bit of a bad day. You're feeling a bit stressed, worried. Let's take a minute and reset. And that word changes things like the oxygen advantage word. It's just about how you target people. And it's all the same work, but it's about making it relatable to people that they're not going to think this is wishy-washy stuff. And the science is proven, you know, every time I would put something up on my Instagram about cold water therapy or breath work and actually back it up with your science and your work, that's when people think, all right, this, this is real. It's not just some sort of, you know, meditation group. It's actually science. I think the science is very important as much as, as far as we know, um, because ultimately it's leading to happiness and something had come into my head there, but obviously it, it went, but. Um... If, if I could just add to something, um, I think Caroline just put that so beautifully in mm. terms of, of changing the language around it and also presenting to people just how effective it is in, in the moment and how quickly it can be effective. I think there's also, you know, preconceptions that this is something that you have to train at, you know, almost, you know, the, like the monk in the monastery or the yogi in the cave, that this is something that you only get to feel the benefits of, you know, after six months or, you know, what one of the, weirdly, it's such a small thing, but it ha always seems to have a big impact at any of the talks I do, particularly in companies, where usually it takes the format of someone from the company introducing me and giving a little spiel about me. And then I stand up and go, hello, everybody. And the talk begins. And when I tell them that, you know, I'm using box breathing, you know, our, our square breathing, our 16 seconds, or however. So for people who don't know, um, you're breathing in for four, you're holding the breath for four, you're letting it go for four and then uh, holding again for four. And I, when I tell them that I was using that technique while I was being introduced it, to, to all of them so that when I did stand up and go, hello, everybody, it's lovely to be here, that my stress response wasn't activated. My nerves weren't taken over. I may still have a few butterflies, but I know that ultimately I have a little more control than I would if I was stressed out when they go, oh, like literally you were using it just sitting there in front of us. I'm like, yes. These are the moments when you use it. These are the, this is it working in practice, you know? And I know that sounds, it's not particularly impressive, you know, but. Oh, it's, I think German, it's, it's highly you know, impressive. Most people cave in. How many people get on live television and they have a panic attack? And this is the stuff that Caroline was talking about. I had a similar experience on national TV. It hasn't been put live yet. And I was put into a, a panel of individuals and I was left waiting, first of all, for five hours. And then I was left sitting outside the door for seven minutes and I could feel my heart rate. Bump, 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 bump. So my heart rate was elevating. And one of the presenters said, go and take a deep breath. And I says, no, no, I'm not taking a deep breath. And I just stood there and I did similar to you. You did box breathing. I just took a self breath in and a really slow and relaxed, gentle breath out. And I'm standing there. Nobody even knows what you're doing. And I was able to bring down my heart rate. And I was able to walk into that room. And the critical mind was put aside. And I was very focused. I, you know, I felt it. I was able to have such degree of self-regulation. And with a simple tool that's seen as woo-woo, this left of side, field, there was nothing woo-woo about me going into that interview. There's nothing woo-woo about you going to present to this corporate audience or the child going in to do an exam. Yeah, I think it's great stuff. And you do. I, I know I'm, you do. You know, both of you talking about this from a male's perspective, this is what's vital here is 
men struggle to, to talk about these things. They struggle to be part of it. I know when I talk about the likes of the Wim Hof stuff, you do have to go and lie down and find a space and do all of these things to, to do the Wim Hof stuff. Not everybody will find the time or want to go and do those things. But with this work, for men that struggle to talk about their emotions, their stress levels, how they're feeling, this is perfect what you're doing. You know, it's no one even needs to know that you're struggling. And this is why I'm really passionate in terms of the kids um, in school is that we don't want them to ever get to that point of highly anxious, highly depressed, worried about the future, feeling like they can't cope, feeling like they can't go on, suicidal. If we can get to them at the beginning where they learn how to breathe and cope then we don't need to ever go down that route of antidepressants or, you know, six or seven counseling sessions before you start to feel a little bit better. This is instant. And that's why I am so passionate about it because God, if only this happened so many years ago, I wouldn't have thought there was something wrong with me. You know, all it took was to slow down your breathing, to relax, to just be in the moment. And it's great to see men like you talking about this. And I've spoken about it before, go into that Wim Hof experience I was one of the only females at that and there was 300 people at it. And I was one of maybe 20 women at the, the thing, but I was so astounded and delighted to see so many men there, but it had to be something macho. That's, you know, if that was a retreat with Wim Hof where he was just doing yoga, you wouldn't have had the men. Men will only connect to something that allows them to still keep that alpha male appearance, which is great and it's lovely, but it's also stopping a lot of men from being able to open up with their emotions. And this is what you're saying is, you know, no one even needs to know that you're you're doing this. It's private, it's personal, and it works. Mm. And even I, I love the story of, you know, when you talk about men gravitating towards it in, in a different way. Um, my own teacher, wonderful man called David G in, in California that I learned all this from, um, he teaches meditation to the San Francisco Police Department. Um, I would guess quite a stressed out bunch of men and women who see all kinds of things on a daily basis, except he doesn't call it meditation when he's with them. They call it tactical breathing, mm. you know, which sounds very hoorah. Um, but who cares? You know, if if that's the language that gets them over the threshold, then so be it. You know, for some people, it's scented candles and, you know, and, and lovely music and dim lighting for other people. It's, it, you know, it's. Is tactical breathing, you know, at work or, or whatever language you want to couch it in or however you want to present it. I, I think we just need to, you know, to, to open that up, just like Caroline is doing with the, with the you know, the children and, and, and changing the language around it to, to resetting. You know, we need to come up with so many new ways of presenting this simple, effective information to people so that everybody's involved. Everybody feels like they have access to it. And it's not just the yogis, the monks, the high performance athletes, our, our military, our, our law enforcement. Yeah, I know we, we're going to have a conversation about Kilimanjaro, but I actually think this is an even better conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's how it goes. It ties in. It ties in. Like, okay. it what was interesting was last week on, on Friday night, I was at a wellness um event. It was the FELA it, on the Falls Road in Belfast they put on every year and they held a mental health event, which was powerful. And Mick Conlon, uh, the Olympic boxer got up and I know Patrick, you've done great work with him. He sang your praises and he stood there and he talked to the audience, you know, about his own successes and his struggles and all the rest. And the biggest thing that he talked about was about breathing, about learning how to breathe properly. And this ties into all parts of your life, whether you want to calm down, you want to relax, whether you're struggling with anxiety or you want to perform better both in the workplace and in, you know, your fitness or your sports or whatever it is you're doing, even just being able to focus in the classroom. How many times throughout our years in school did we nearly fall asleep on, on the teacher? And, you know, I think um, if I had taped my mouth back then, I might have been able to stay awake a few more hours or listen to a few more of the lessons that, that I zoned out of. And this all ties in, it's all related. This is what's going to get us to the top of Kilimanjaro, uh, Dermot, because you know you hear so many fit people who have trained and trained and they didn't make it to the top. So it's mindfulness, it's having the right mindset and it's all about our breathing. And 
you know, like Patrick said about having the pulse oximeter is that we can, you know, reassure ourselves that as soon as our mind starts to wander and we start to get a sore head, that it might actually just be our mind taken over and that we're actually okay. We just need to reconfirm to the body, slow down our breath again. It's not what we think it is if we do the readings and continue to go further. So I think it, it all ties in, in my opinion. Yeah, Ryan, do you I think really? Oh, sorry, Darwin, yeah. So I just just to pick up on that, um, I think, you know, Kilimanjaro is is very much an extreme event that, you know, maybe a lot of your listeners will never actually do in their lifetime. Maybe some of them will. Some of them will be inspired by this conversation um, because I'm certainly not a professional climber. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about taking it on. But, you know, what Caroline was touching on there is, is the reassurance of knowing that we're going to go up the mountain, but that we have tools in our toolkit to reach for. And, you know, for me, I think, you know, these techniques, why why they're so important is that whether you're on Kilimanjaro or not, maybe something else in your life is your own personal Kilimanjaro. But just knowing that you have these techniques in your toolkit, that when, you know, the you know what hits the fan, that you're not going to be floundering, that you go, do you know what? I learned these techniques from the oxygen advantage. Or I learned these techniques um, from Caroline in the classroom, or I learned them from Dermot in a talk or whatever it happens to be. And for a lot of people that I speak to, it's just simply the knowing that they have stuff in their toolkit that they can reach for at that moment. Um, whether you're on top of a mountain or whether you're about to sit a state exam or job interview, driving test, maternity ward, whatever it happens to be. Um, and oftentimes, Simply the knowing uh, that you have those techniques is enough, actually, to keep you in a state that's calm enough to get you through the event. I think it's a great point. And I think also you will be practicing these techniques in the lead up to it. In other words, you're not going to wait to the day of the event before you start. You will bring these into your everyday. And then that's it's the knowing, but also the experience of it. And the same coming up to the exam. Don't wait for the exam to happen. And then you start thinking, oh, my God, there's a technique. I must start doing it. But it's doing it in the preparation, in the lead up. It does give us that we're all vulnerable as human beings. And it, it kind of gives us that comfort knowing that we have planned and we've we've given our best shot. I think that's ultimately what it's about, isn't it? Do you think Kilimanjaro is, if I use the word, a spiritual experience? or do you, do you, I think it kind of ties in with meditation. I don't. I don't think the mind is. What? What? In terms of the mind itself, what do you foresee during the ascent? Is that for me, Patrick? And um, that will be for either of you. <laughs> you want to go for both of you. Both of you. Okay. Well, look. Uh, um. You know, for me, I. I don't think you can do something like this without it becoming a spiritual experience. You know, I think anything where we're pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone um and i guess allowing ourselves to experience new things in fairly dramatic surroundings i mean it 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 has to be spiritual i i guess spirit you know the word spiritual can sound a bit fluffy all right but i think i think it's really about growth you know it's about allowing yourself to to really expose yourself to to learning new things to learning new states for surviving those states for thriving in those states so and i think that's wherever we're feeling growth and and you sprinkle it with a little sense of awe you start to move into that spiritual zone you know and um i guess if you think back to the times in your life where you felt you know a, a strong spiritual sense it tends to be it you know could be again in in a maternity ward witnessing a birth of a child or um a particularly beautiful spot in nature or even as something as dark as grief these can all be spiritual events and i i think they're all the, the things they share in, in common is is a a sense of growth and a sense of awe and if we can combine those and and keep ourselves in, in a state that we're we're physically and mentally able to to be aware and 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 to be present for those those moments and those sensations then i think that's that's where we feel that's that spirituality. Mm. 
I agree. I, I'm sure there won't be much room for thought up there. I think the, the very surrounds are going to bring you into stillness. And mm-hmm. for me, sometimes, and I would agree, like the word spirituality, it's very, it's everybody has their own interpretation of it. And I once heard it was described as the degree to which you are free from thought, that you're connected with everything that's going on around us, which in turn is, you could call it focused attention. You could call it, call it that you're not living in your head. In other words, I'm going to put it this way. You're not going to go up Kilimanjaro living and stuck in your head. It's going to be um, a challenge to bring you out of your head and to connect with everything that's going on around you and to surrender to the to the the work of achieving it. And it's not always, a, I suppose, reaching the top. That's going to be the you know the icing on the cake, but the real achievement is is in the ascent, is in, in the work that's, because as human beings, we always want to have endeavors. We're always striving to 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 better ourselves. And I think that's going to be a great, um, a great accomplishment, you know? It's, I think it's, it's amazing, well done. Um, for somebody to hear of you, because your book, Dermot, Caroline, how do people get access to you? I might put it to Caroline first. Um, you can find me on um Spotify. My podcast is a county down under, and my Instagram is a county down under. Um, and I am, you know, documenting each day what I'm doing to train, and you know, nine times out of ten, that is mindfulness and breath work and the odd hike every couple of weeks when I can find one, uh, time to do one. But uh, yeah, you can find me there. Um, I'm looking forward to sending both of you a picture at the top of Kilimanjaro. I keep visioning that that sunrise at the top. I'm going to be standing at the top regardless of what obstacles may come in the way. Great stuff. Fair play. And Dermot? Uh, Well, you used to be able to find me on the radio, (laughs) but that's changing. But I'm delighted to say you can find me uh, on Instagram. I'm Dermot Whelan official. Um, uh, also DermotWhelan.com and there's free guided meditations there and uh, information on any tours or books or anything that I'm doing. And um, my book is Mindful. Um, it's available for anybody who feels like they want a, a humorous doorway into the whole world of meditation and some techniques that have really worked for me over the years. And that uh, I think we all know between us, you know, work for a lot of other people as well. It's a lovely book. I've read it. It's it's really a great gateway, even whether if somebody is experienced in meditation or if it's just your, your entry to it. I always kind of think that any of us who went into breathing space or went into meditation or mindfulness, we always fell into it due to our own health issues. It's quite interesting, you know, um, that, and how the three of you, your existing issues, as me included, then has directed that as a career path that we've seen there's something in it and we want to get it out there. It's nice Thank work. You. I'm going to yeah. kind of bring that together. Like, in terms of Caroline and Dermot, is it something you've observed? You know, yeah, I find um, my favorite quote is from the ashes rises the phoenix. I think you need to go through your own struggles to to come out and see things with fresh eyes and then help others. And all the work that three all three of us are doing here is from passion and love. And that comes across, you know, there's a lot of people that are unfortunately, I don't know, like, they're not in this industry for for the right reasons or they may have gone into it for the right reasons but they see an opportunity but I think hard work and passion shines through and people that genuinely care about others and uh, you know there's another famous quote where uh, you know they say if you love what you do you never work a day in your life but I don't think that's true because if you love what you do you actually work harder (laughs) you do but you're aligned but you're aligned with what you're doing I don't think it's the same struggle there's something that comes and you know what helpful events happen as well like we've had things that have knocked on our doors and you think my god when you look back you know the last 20 years things fall into place um, and I know people talk about the secret. You remember that book that came out about 15 years ago? And to be honest with you, I, I'm not a total fan of that. But I do believe this. Our mindset, if we are in the right place and if we can find something that is aligned with us, it's easier and things fall into place. 
and we attend to, to attract it. And that's irrespective. I'm not saying it's the secret, but it's the secret that kind of comes to mind, you know. Dermot, last word. Ah, uh, gosh, I mean, I, I, I like that you were touching on synchronicities there. And, you know, certainly um, I, I I became super aware of, of your work and the Oxygen Advantage shortly after the whole Kilimanjaro idea, um, you know, popped into my uh, popped into my world. So I love how our our paths have have crossed. I spoke about the synchronicity with Caroline that as I was interviewing her on the radio, I was like, hang on a sec. I think we're going to be on a podcast together soon. So I, I really do believe if, you know, when we can, as you say, you know, you use the word aligned, that's really important to me now. And, you know, it, it sometimes it can be hard work to strip away the things that, that, you know, aren't in alignment with you, you know, that maybe you've, you've taken on board because out of sense of duty or just habit or, you know, fear, you know, that you don't want to let them go. So um, certainly for me, I, I'm very excited about, about being in this space and, and sharing your techniques um, with as many people as I can. And, and certainly up that mountain, I will be leaning heavily on your techniques <laughs> because the idea of altitude sickness, I find quite uh off-putting so i'm going to try and avoid it at all costs <laughs> great stuff it was a pleasure thanks very much guys don't go away thank, thank you, you.